When you think of ground types that don't have a lot of speed, that only start with basic normal moves, you can start to imagine the potential problems. Brock isn't easy, you're weak to Misty, then you're weak to Erica, and way down the line you have Lorelai waiting with her ice types, and of course you got Lance's Gyarados, it's chomping at the bit at the end of the game to give you the pump of the Hydro variety, but today I'm here to show you why you need to put some respect on Sandslash's name, so grab yourself a Sodi Pop and get ready for a banger. Sand Slash is only going to look semi-impressive at one single thing at first glance, and it's going to fit perfectly into that Generation 1 ground top mold. It has pretty solid attack, not bad at all, but it is significantly lower than something like Rhydon or Golem, but it makes up for it with base speed. Now it sounds a little bit weird to praise base 65 speed, but trust me when I say this is so much better than you think, and for me personally after playing so many runs, 65 base speed is about the bare minimum to not be a hindrance in the playthrough. When you look at the level up learn set, Sand Slash, he definitely gets moves. Outside of Slash and maybe some situational uses of Sand Attack, let's keep it real, this is pure garbage, but where this Pokemon stands out like so many other Gen 1 Pokemon is that TM list. Stabbed Earthquake, Body Slam, Rock Slide, they give you a well-rounded top tier physical set, but Swords Dance, that's gonna be the glue that holds it all together, and it's gonna give Sand Slash that chef's kiss perfect late game move set, but getting to that point while still maintaining a fast pace, that's the real question. So just to be up front here, the first split of the game wasn't easy, so let's kind of start from the top, go over how I decided to handle Brock with only Scratch. I start out with the Nidoran last and Viridian, and to not waste my time too much, I do Pepper and Sand Attack here. Now what this does is it makes it way less likely to hit Growl, and what I'm referring to is the fact that stat lowering moves by the opponent, they already have an inherent 25% chance to miss in the first place, so add in the Sand Attack debuff, it just makes it a little bit quicker. If you get Growled, it's gonna, it's gonna take a while. From there, I take on the first optional Bug Catcher. Now I'm gonna skip over the second optional one because Metapods can waste a ton of time with Harden, and this little guy has two of them. Then I'm gonna take on the third and final optional Bug Catcher, and then after the mandatory battle at the end of the forest, I am gonna hit level nine, and this is where I'm gonna do a single blackout of the Light Years Junior Trainer. Now if you're wondering, why not just do the blackout grinding for the full experience here? It's because Sand Slash just isn't really that good at it. Usually you'll want a stall move just to let the opponent get free damage to make it quick as possible, but when Sand Attack is your stall move, it really prolongs the fight to the point to where it's just faster to do the Force Trainers. The sole exception here is that double Metapod Bug Catcher that we skipped earlier, and that's pretty much why we're only doing this once. Now you can see, even just one blackout is a bit of a slog, it takes quite a while, but when we are done, when we finally beat the trainer, I'm gonna be level 11, and that means we have Brock coming up. I went back and forth of this route guys. You can technically do this fight at level 10 because through the power of Sand Attack all things are possible so jot that down. But it was about as far away from consistent as it really gets. I felt like there was maybe a 10% chance there and you might be wondering why level 11 is better and it's, to be blunt, it's for the extra speed. I made a mistake here in the final run. I used Sand Attack earlier on the Light Years Trainer, but the overall best practice is to get the Geodude down to about three stages of accuracy debuffs. And honestly, you just kinda hope you make it through this healthy enough. So for this run, there was a fine line between speed and consistency, and at level 11, you're gonna speed tie the Onyx, and that's pretty much the best you can do unless you wanna bloat your time and just be kinda slow. This is a battle of attrition, and the speed tie makes it a gamble at times. You wanna spread out your sand attacks, obviously you don't want it to hit you, but you also wanna use them to avoid bide, and you're gonna run out sooner rather than later. There are some unlucky things that can happen where maybe Onyx is on turn two of its bide, so you go for a sand attack to avoid damage but it wins the coin flip speed tie it unleashes energy and you just waste power points of sand attack but it's just something you kind of have to deal with just like the last video it's worth pointing out that this still isn't consistent i had to restart this run three total times to get this brock result right here so if you're just playing these runs casually or doing your own personal runs you might want to hit level 12 to outspeed the onyx but you know i like to play a little bit riskier sometimes the battle is going to reach a crescendo when you run out of pp and then it becomes a matter of if you can get enough struggles off before a lethal bot hits you and sand slash he stands tall and he outlasts the rock solid pokemon trainer 
So as you can see, the Brock split wasn't easy. And I'd go as far to say that it was probably the biggest puzzle to solve for the run. An 18 minute and 43 second in game time Brock split isn't the best, but don't lose confidence yet because there are some A tier runs that are around this time as well. Remember, Brock is pretty much the definitive biggest wall to runs on average, and Sandslash still has a lot of time left to cook us up something nice. Route 3 is completely standard, but let me say that I've been wanting to do a few runs for a while now. Let's go back to the Krabby stream, and that was kind of like my first inkling that it's a ball form would do really well, and Kingler was a monster of a run. Currently, it sits at 7th place overall after about 70 optimized runs, so runs like Sandshrew, Clefairy, Tentacle, those are runs that I've been meaning to do the evolved forms of, but for whatever reason, I get sidetracked by the side quest, and I'm making a point to do them now. I'm not sure if they're all going to be in a roll or if I can just keep going weekly uploads for a minute, but you can expect them soon, and I am excited to get to route them. As far as Mount Moon goes, I really don't want to do extra training here, but I have to. Doing optional battles with just Scratch, it's not the fastest, but like Sand Slash's name implies, Slash is going to be crucial to this run success. I take on the Super Nerd, and there's a Buck Catcher right next to him. I fight him as well. And that's pretty much all the extras here, because this is going to let me hit level 17, going into the last Pokemon of Jesse and James. And I just, I can't state how big Slash is for the run. I touched on 65 base speed in the intro being kind of like on the low end where it's not really going to affect the run too much but being over 64 speed guarantees that slash will always be a crit and guys i have to say that for the next little bit of the video it's going to be the slash show and it's really going to elevate this run which is it's very thematic now real quick before i forget i did revamp the effective power for generation one high crit moves i touched on it in the tyranitar versus video and you can see it's, it's represented right here on the overlay slash is normally just a 70 base power move but with crit calculated into the effective power it's already a 124 power nuke and you can see why it's so strong so let's put on a showcase for rival number two and to keep this simple slash can just one shot everything outside of our little brother sandshrew and that's because he's protected by aj's favor now if you didn't watch the original anime and my name or maybe any references to aj go over your head just know that to this day i still get a decent amount of comments saying that i sound like him i did like a three-year-old sandshrew video is themed after aj but this one's over let's stop talking about aj let's talk about clusters now what cluster you might ask well my friend the single highest cluster of mandatory battles in the entire game it's found right here and the key to saving time for this run is to use slash as often and as much as possible without having to heal to do this i will sparingly kind of use scratch here and there and kind of plan it out to run out of slash pp on the elixir hacker then i'm going to use that elixir to fuel the slash machine we can finish off the route and now let's talk about the ground topping to no one's surprise sand slash doesn't like to take bubble beams misty is not the ideal matchup but i feel like i say this a lot where i learn a lot from other routes and i'm going to be pulling this from my recent rapid Dash run where I'm going to be doing the dig grunt first along with Misty's gym trainers and it's almost going to take me exactly to where I need to be now regardless of how I routed this run dig is pretty important to the run it has that massive 150 effective power with stab but the first kind of big deviation and the unique aspect of sand slash comes right after the Goldeen Jr. Trainer. I'm going to hit level 23 right after it. And to make this clean, consistent, especially after a luck-based Brock split, I'm going to use two rare candies here. I think that was the correct call. But let's kind of dive into Misty and see what this does. We already outspeed and could one-shot star you even without the candy, so it's irrelevant. Get out of here. Let the adults talk. For Starmie, this was a calculated play where you could tank even a Bubble Beam crit or up to three water guns if need be, but the great thing about level 25 was it pretty much gives you a 50-50 chance just to end the battle instantly with Dig, and that's what you're going to see happen here. At level 23, you're just not as tanky, and while two slashes could get the job done, it was still pretty risky, and I, I was resetting a lot in practice but this paid off for me well and we get that second badge without too much hassle. 
taking it down to the SS and I will be getting body slam but I'm not gonna learn it I'm also gonna get the gentleman candy and that's pretty much it but I would like to touch on something real quick sometimes I feel like I take knowledge for granted and I just I never consider someone new to the world of generation 1 mechanics so you might be asking why would I not learn body slam now why would I even pick it up slash is simply stronger and now that we have the effective power reflecting that we can see it but in the late game guys we'll be using swords dance multipliers like swords dance that's gonna double triple quadruple our attack they'll just be ignored and I guess the main mechanic to keep in mind here is that if your stats are changed whether you get growled or maybe the opponent sets up 36 defense curls crits just ignore those things so slash is great for now but it just doesn't scale into the late game and it's really antithetical to the gen 1 swords dance build so if you didn't know maybe now you do slash would just ignore swords dance it would be weaker I sort of talked over rival number three but my commentary my analysis here is slash I use slash as far as lieutenant surge goes my commentary is use dig compelling commentary from me I know and when you're sitting around with your friends and you're knocking back a couple of soda pops and someone says hey who gives the best old-school Pokemon commentary I think you have to mention my channel because analysis like that it's why I am where I'm at baby but finally the third batch is down and we can talk about split data today's run is more or less just going against Dodrio's time which is about a 90.5 out of a hundred now through practice I felt that like this was a pretty fair rating to chase and you can see that through three splits, it's only a seven second difference. So Sand Slash, even though the Brock split may be fun a little slow, it is keeping pace for an A tier finish. And we can just keep it moving. We don't have to look at Rock Tunnel. Instead, I think we can just skip straight to Celadon. And that's going to take us straight to the Rocket Hideout. Now, generally, it's all or nothing here. You're going to get the high money items or you're just going to skip them. But for the only time that I can really remember, I'm only going to pick up a couple. I'm going to cut out the nugget on the first tile puzzle floor because that just saves the most time out of the three items here. But that's going to give us all the money that I need. And then Giovanni is going to be a cakewalk with Dig. So let's just jump straight into that Celadon buy. Here, I'm going to keep it pretty simple. I do the standard stuff, but I don't need any extra TMs for extra money. And on the top floor rock slide is going to be a pretty nice pickup but just like body slam it's not time to learn it just yet but it will help later i talked about being able to skip the nugget in the hideout and here i'm going to have just enough money to buy four carbos and i need every little drop of speed that i can get this along with the three free accessible carbos in the overworld it's going to be crucial for one gym specifically and it's going to help out in other areas but after that i'm going to pick up fly and it's on to pokemon tower Holding off on Rock Slide makes a lot of sense for multiple reasons, but the main one here is that Slash still has a great chance to one-shot the Firo, which we get here, and we're going to need to hang on to Dig until there's no more overworld Dig time saves. But we have more than enough damage here, and we have enough speed to outspeed the Ghastly, so let's move to Cycling Road. This is gonna be the one spot after Brock where I'm gonna inject extra training. The bikers on Cycling Road have become my go-to training spot over the past few months. And even if you don't have a move like Dig, it's still pretty good just because of where it falls in the game. Things like Sylph do have a lot of trainers, but they aren't all efficient. It's really hit or miss there. On top of that, other training spots, they occur like in a time where you're on the straight line path to a major battle and maybe some PP problems can arise. And Cycling Road's in this little area, in this little perfect lull in the game where you're just doing busy work and you're transitioning down to Fuchsia and the Safari Zone, and it feels pretty nice. Overall, there's going to be eight bikers littered around the zone, with seven of them being pretty quick sources of good experience. Now, if you're wondering, the eighth biker that I always skip is going to be on the right side. He has two Voltorbs. It's not really efficient at all. But the other ones just have poison types. So as a ground type, they are about as fast as it can be. Investing this time now and just cutting out any extra training later, it, it's paid dividends. And I guess you'll have to tell me what you think about that when you see the final result. When I wrap that up and finish the Safari Zone, I'm going to pivot over to Sylph, and you probably already know why. Sylph has the upgrade equivalents for this run that's pretty much equal to fighting with a pocket knife going from that to an AK-47, so the first order of business is to get to that 10th floor as fast as possible. The Carbos, the Rare Candy, they're great, but Earthquake is here, and remember, I'm holding on to three very good TMs at this point in my bags, and I'm about to get another one before I transition. So generally speaking, I've been wrong about how I get Swords Dance for the longest time. 
time. I'll get the card key, I'll walk up, I'll use the stairs to go to the sixth, then the seventh floor, then I'll go down and I'll get Swords Dance. This route that I'm showing here is better overall, but it's not really that significant. It just feels a little bit better, and the only trade-off is that you have to be careful about not accidentally battling this grunt here. I find it pretty wild that I can play this game so many times over the years and still discover slightly better ways to do things, but like I just said, there's a major change in the learn set here. I'll be learning Earthquake, Body Slam, Swords Dance, and the only original move that's going to stay is Dig, and I've already mentioned it, it's for the time saves in the overworld. Now this isn't the first or last run that we're going to have Dig and Earthquake on the set for a while, but if you want to point it out to me in the comments for the 40th time, I will take that free engagement. But new moves, Sand Slash, he's basically just slapped a rocket onto its back, and we're about to be propelled towards that in game, but it is time for rival number 5. So most of you have been around for a while and you know how it's going to go from here on out. In an optimized run featuring a move like Swords Dance, one of the biggest factors in saving time is crunching how many times you need to set up and figuring out what combinations of moves will make the rest of the battles in the game last the least amount of turns possible. The answer here for this specific battle is two Swords Dance and you just hope you don't take too much damage while you spend your two turns setting up. And earlier I told you guys that 65 base speed is great because outside of Kadabra, I outspeed everything naturally. You could get crit, but Kadabra, in my opinion, is way less threatening than Alakazam on the rival team in red version, and overall, we get our first little nibble, our first little taste of how the late game is going to look for our slashy boy. Afterwards, I'm going to wrap up Sylph with ease, and this run has something really funny about it. I felt like I've, I've done so much important things, and I've been going really fast, but I have not fought a gym leader since Surge, so needless to say, the split data going from the Surge split to the next split is going to look very weird, and that's why I show and focus on split data for the first three splits and the final few splits, because there's a lot of routing quirks like this, but it is interesting because solid Gen 1 runs, they take about two and a half hours give or take and we spent nearly an hour between splits here but I think it just goes to show you how sort of open-ended the game can be after you make it to Celadon that's why I love the game but let's turn that dial pick up the pace a little bit let's get through these next couple of gems we got Erica up first, and this one was doable earlier, but for the sake of speed, setting up once and putting all three of her Pokemon into a guaranteed one-shot range just felt better, because if you take this on earlier, it meant that it was a range and a lot of hits, and if you took a Mega Drain early, or maybe you missed a knockout and got hit with a Razor Leaf, or you got put to sleep, it could cause a reset, or in the worst case scenario, you could waste a ton of time, but this one is quick. Let's hop straight over to Koga. Level 43 was very important here, because this is the level where you can just one-shot the opening Venonat and that's significant because the second Venonat doesn't know Sleep Powder. The worst case scenario here is that it maybe will go for Supersonic while you do your one setup and even if it does, it still has to go through that 55% accuracy and then even if it hits, I still have a 50-50 chance to still get my damage through. So what I'm trying to say at the end of the day is that eliminating Sleep Powder as a factor, it made this one pretty much only like a minor inconvenience, a little speed bump and that's just gonna, we cruise to another badge here. That's going to take us to a brisk swim down to Cinnabar. There's nothing extra, everything straight down to business. And after we take a brief rest and just kind of wonder if TM28 is actually Tombstoner, brother, or not, we can take a look at Blaine. So this one can be a little bit volatile, and the best thing that can happen is you set up and Nine Tails goes for a Tail Whip. That'll give you two badge boosts to your speed, it'll let you outspeed the first two Pokemon, and that's exactly what happens here, so that's pretty cool. But you do level up after Rapidash, so your speed goes back down. And while we can one-shot Arcanine, it will get one chance, and you can see that we're healthy enough that we can survive a Fire Blast. It does a ton of damage, but the important thing here is that we survive, we get off the Earthquake, and if you're keeping count at home, that's six badges down. On to Sabrina and the Carpos and everything we've set up in this route is so important because we're at 104 speed. What's the significance of that? Abra has 103. Since Abra is pretty much only going to go for Flash and be really annoying, we can just take it out immediately and not have to worry about it. Now since the other two Pokemon are pretty much going to outspeed us no matter what and we have the damage just to get through it, I find it's better just to take the risk of just going straight Earthquake. That's what I do. I get pretty lucky on the moves, but we could at least take one hit outside of a crit. So it doesn't look too too bad, but getting that 104 speed, getting past the Abra with ease, that was pretty much crucial for this fight to make it at least kind of consistent. 
Going straight into the final gym, I do have the full learn set. Dig is no longer required because Sabrina was the last Dig overworld time save. But Duck Trio's up first. You need to set up once here, but sand attack and things of that nature can be annoying. So just take it out immediately. You have the damage. Set up one time is all you need. And it's a lot better to do it on Persian because it's a lot less threatening. And if you make it to that point, you got that plus two on your attack. That's the battle over. You have enough damage just to sweep. AJ Jr. looking pretty prime. Time I'm looking good, but let's not waste any time. We can just go straight into rival number six now. This one plays out pretty much just like rival number five. You need to set up a couple of times in the sand slash and you just hope that it doesn't slash and just take you down really low. I did have like a contingency plan here. If I took too much damage, I would set up one more time later like on the Magnemite, maybe outspeed the Kadabra to make this safe. But the truth is I got pretty lucky on the sand slash in this run and I never really had to worry about it. So once I get to that plus four, I don't really care about anything else and I can just go on the sweep and we've seen it multiple times already this run and we just know how swords dance runs go i pretty much just rolled to this fight like a freight train and now we're pretty much looking ahead at the league looking ahead i do one extra thing i'm going to be picking up that rare candy in victory road i'm not going to do any extra battles and i'm just going to get to the elite four as fast as i can but now we can take a look at split data once again and i feel like i say this all the time i'm sure you guys get it by now but the middle splits are just weird and this run is perhaps the weirdest looking split data i've seen so far because you can see it was so close after surge but we just did so much between surge and erica that there's a 32 minute gap and then you can see the splits are looking kind of weird. But when we get to Giovanni, we got a three minute lead over this 90 out of 100 pace. And since we don't have to do any more training, it's pretty quick. We actually accrue a 10 minute lead going into the Elite Four. So needless to say, this run is in a very, very prime position to not only get A tier, but to significantly rise up it. So that's pretty interesting. Now remember, we are a ground top. We are weak to Lorelei. We're weak to Gyarados. So I'm sure you're wondering how we'll handle those kind of things but just know that I'm not gonna use any rare candies yet I'm gonna fight Lorelai at my current level and I'm not even scared about it it's in my opinion that if you have a setup move a yellow version Lorelai specifically is pretty easy but without further ado I think we just fade to black we can take a look at the elite four and talk about it touched on this before but let me go over it again. There's AI modifications that every trainer in the game follows, but Lorelai's Dugong specifically has very special modifications and it's, it's unique in that aspect. What this boils down to is that turn two, it has about an 81% chance to use rest. That means you chip it down and you just tank whatever damage. This bubble beam does crazy amounts of damage by the way. And then you just start setting up Swords Dance with the knowledge that there's a you know four out of five chance that it's just gonna use rest anyway that'll get you a free setup and then you don't even have to worry about anything it doesn't matter if you're quadruple weak to eyes it doesn't matter if you're 15 times weak to eyes you can just get through this fight and it's pretty much guaranteed outside of maybe one exception now remember here a stabbed earthquake does just as much damage as a super effective rock slide it's just more accurate and that's why I go for it here but you're gonna see me crit and that's gonna be the one lose condition that we had for this fight and that means we're gonna go down and we're gonna have the very first reset in an otherwise pretty immaculate run now we'll hop back into the fight and everything's gonna go how it's supposed to turn two, rest set up sweep you kind of get the gist by now but I find it crazy and I guess it's like and I don't know if this is gonna be a tangent here but it's almost like people just don't watch my videos and by people I mean like other people in the community I can't tell you how many streams I've seen of people playing runs that are weak to ice and they get to Lorelai and they act like they don't know what to do and it's just it's such a simple solution if you just take a minute and just kind of learn the game a little bit more we've seen like in the Firo versus Dodrio race those Pokemon really don't have any answer for Lorelai but you can manipulate the AI set up a little bit and just get the damage required now what was normally a really tough fight looks pretty trivial that's why we could save the candy and I think it's just really important to touch on Dugong's specific AI because it does make this fight a lot easier. Now, if you're wondering, what about red version? It does work to a certain extent, but there's around only like a 50% chance that the Dugong will use rest turn two. It's only yellow version specifically that it's all the way up to like 81%. But let's not rant. We got the victory. Let's move it on to Bruno. You 
probably don't need to set up on this fight, but I do two times. That's so I can save some Earthquake PP. There is one scary moment in this fight. It's where I crit on a body slam. I don't knock out the Hitmonchan, and if it went for counter, that would have been bad. But what I'm trying to do here, you notice I haven't healed. I'm trying to get through the first three Elite Four members without healing, without using an Elixir, because I felt like I was a little bit sloppy in my overworld movement, and I just wanted to make up just a little bit of time here, so that's why I'm just playing a little bit fast and loose here. Here, but it does work out here and we're moving on to Agatha but before we get into the fight I am going to use all of my rare candies I used two early to get to 25 on Misty but I do have nine left and that's going to take me up to level 60 so let's just hop into this battle real quick now notice I haven't healed I'm not really worried look at the speed I outspeed the first Gengar and it's just a matter of hitting A on Earthquake and that one's over with now there's one thing in this fight it's going to be a two shot on the Golbat so I set up one Swords Dance the amount of turns equal to the same but it gives me a speed badge boost and that's just gonna let me outspeed the final Gengar as well so once I get that and I make it through the Golbat without getting confused or something annoying like that it means that this battle's done already and like I said earlier I was playing a little bit risky because I wanted to save time and remember going into the Lorelei fight we took that turn one bubble beam it did so much damage and we haven't healed since then we haven't even used an elixir either but Sand Slash is looking pretty dominant but Lance's Gyarados how will we handle Lance Lance's Gyarados, I think we should just take a look. So you already know Hydro Pump's gonna be a problem. The idea here is to set up one Swords Dance and then we can rock slide it, get it out of here and move on with the fight. Now here, it's just gonna miss. It simply just misses the Hydro Pump and that means this is a free fight for the most part, but let me just pause it real quick. Now normally I don't show damage ranges or anything like that. I feel like they kind of detract from the flow of the narrative of the story, but I need to show it here because on paper it looks like I got really lucky and you might be thinking, oh the Gyarados, of course it missed the Hydro Pump on the very first turn and you got lucky and whatever but that's not really the case this run was planned out meticulously you already know it's the optimized run but after you set up one swords dance look at these damage ranges here you can see that the hydro pump only has about a 15 percent chance to knock me out what that roughly translates to is that there's an 85 percent chance that i'll just survive the hydro pump anyway and still continue on the fight so what i'm trying to say here is that it was really consistent and it's not quite as bad or luck based as it might seem on the surface. There's a big stigma around Lance's Gyarados, and yes, it is bad if you're weak to it, but outside of a crit, Sand Slash would have been just fine. And there's even some contingency plans here. Remember how high Sand Slash's defenses are? You're gonna level up after Gyarados anyway, and you can just set up a couple more times. And since I got lucky in this fight, I do set up a couple of times just to outspeed the Aerodactyl, just to make sure that this one flows pretty smooth. But I did want to break that down for you guys and let you know that even though this one looks really good, it's really clean and I'm very happy with the result. Sand Slash is a good enough Pokemon where it can just take that Hydro Pump straight to the jaw and still keep on trucking. So pretty good. There's only one final battle left. I don't love this fight and in a perfect world you'd have another level right here but pretty much the whole run using the early candies then using everything to make sure Lance's Gyarados was pretty consistent it leads to what we see here just like always we do have to set up on Sand Slash but we are going to level up that means there's no point in fully setting up but I do need to set up just once that's going to give me good one shot ranges on the Sand Slash itself and it's going to guarantee that I can take out the Alakazam now I talked about how I got pretty lucky on the Sand Slash earlier in the video and here here, it's going to go for some pretty hard hitting moves and it's going to take away a lot of my health limping into the Alakazam and remember I don't outspeed it because I level up I have no badge boost. I get a little luck here it only goes for recover that allows me to get off the earthquake and from there this one's pretty much a wrap and you might be wondering why if you are weak to grass in Pokemon Yellow you have a huge advantage because Executor will only use Leech Seed and, and unless that's going to kill you in the next few turns you can just fully set up and that's what I'm going to do here and what that means is not only do I have 742 attack I'm rumbling down like a freight train off the top of a mountain but I also have enough speed to trivialize everything else and before you know it we're earthquaking we're body slamming until the game tells us that we won and that's the run over Sand Slash finishes with a time of 2 hours, 20 minutes, and 42 seconds with one reset, and that is a fantastic run. Following in the footsteps of something like Kingler, 
I just knew some of these evolved runs were going to be really good and it just kind of makes me I don't want to have too high expectations but I think Clefable and I think that Tentacruel is going to be pretty good as well but what does that give us on the tiered card ranking here it's going to give us a 94.29 out of 100 and that is a really high score so as we bring this tier list out it's not good enough for top three but where will it rank on the A tier it's going to put this mono ground type Pokemon in ninth place overall which is really solid it beats out the likes of Cloyster and Starmie now some of those other runs I think will redo and they will be a little bit better just but for the time being sand slash has knocked it out of the park i'm very happy with the route and how this video went and like i've already said a couple of times i cannot wait to get some of these other evolved forms that i've already kind of seen what the pre-evolved form could do i can't wait to see how they perform in their runs and sand slash was just the first one and it's pretty good now who would have thought something that gets a pretty early slash maybe has like a toolkit that can cheese through brock a little bit quicker than it's supposed to gets things like body slam earthquake rock slide and then it can transition into that swords dance late game it felt really good and the easier brock split of yellow it definitely paid off for this one i might sprinkle in a run between those other two runs but clefable tentacruel those are things that are on my mind i do need to get another crystal run out maybe another cross gen run i don't know it's whatever i'm feeling really guys but i think we'll have fun we'll have a good time no matter what now i think that this video is going to be dropping around the time where it's pretty much right time for midterms so it's going to be really busy for me so i probably won't have time to work on a video for another week or so so we'll probably have to skip a week but that's fine but if you made it this far i appreciate you you're a real one comment that down below if you are so inclined to do so and special shout out to my channel members and patreons it means the world to me that you guys support me and i do think that's about all i have for you sometimes i don't really know what to say here but the only thing on my mind right now is hey i gotta edit this video and then i gotta draw sand slash from the thumbnail but i'm out of here i'll catch you on the next one bye